as well as one of the editors in chief of the Journal of Learning Analytics. So her work has been influential in shaping the field and supporting implementations across Europe and promoting a focus on social learning analytics and on ethics. The other focus is my as well as one of the editors in chief of the journal. Okay. <clears throat> Her other focus is on micro-credentials on which she has worked as the academic lead at Open University. And this includes a leading role in the creation of Future Learn and the work of work as a pedagogic advisor for this company in its first years. Again, many of us have heard of Future Learn as one of the MOOC um, course offering companies. So without further ado, let me hand over the mic to Rebecca and <clears throat> over to you, Rebecca. Thank you very much uh, for that welcome. And let me now share my screen and um, check that that is working for everybody so you can see it clearly. So, um, right, can you see my slides now? I hear nothing, so I'm assuming people can, can yeah, see my yeah, slides yeah. otherwise. Yeah, yes, you. great, that's lovely. Right, great. Uh, so it's, it's lovely to be with you virtually today. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to talk here at uh, ICCE. Um, and thank you very much to those of you who have got up early to hear me. Um, I, I hope uh, it, it merits getting up so early. Um, for those of you uh, who would like to catch up on this uh, afterwards or to look at it in more detail, I've put the slides up on SlideShare um, and I've put some of the links there and I've put some of the text there um, so that you can follow up there if you would like to. So um, I'm from the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University. Um, which is based in the United Kingdom. Um, it's a distance university. It's the biggest university in the UK, one of the biggest in Europe. Uh, it's been running for 50 years. And within the Open University, uh, my department uh, does a lot of work around educational technology and around exploring the possibilities of educational technology. And one of the things that we've been doing for uh, the last 10 years, since, since 2012, is every year we've been producing the innovating pedagogy reports. Um, I put the link to those up online uh, because they're all available, they're all openly available, and each one of them is looking ahead at how pedagogy may develop and how it is developing at the moment. So this is something that we do in our department, uh, but we also work with partners around the world uh, for the last, I think, eight years, we have partnered with a different institution each year. Um, so it's not only based on what we're thinking about the future of education. It's based on uh, what experts around the world are thinking about the future of education. Um, so you'll see we've worked with people in the United States, in Singapore, Israel, Norway, Ireland. Um, and we'll be working again this year with, with another um, institution. So the Innovating Pedagogy Report, uh, when it started in 2012, uh, the Horizon Reports, which you may know, um, were already well established. Uh, but we felt the, the Horizon Reports focused very much on technologies. Uh, so they'd introduce um, something which had been introduced in the technology sector and discuss that. And we felt that was a that was very important and very useful, but we wanted to think about it more from the pedagogy perspective. Um, so all our uh, reports focus on pedagogies that are up and coming. Some of them involve technologies. Uh, some of them uh, have technology optional. Some of them don't require um, uh, technologies, uh, but they're, they're all things which uh, you might want to introduce um, into your classroom or into your university or into your uh, business training setting. So you might be asking, well, why do we do this every year? 
I mean, most of you uh, will have established ways of teaching. They work very well. Uh, at our university, we have ways of teaching that work very well. So why would we be looking out for other ways of doing this? And I think there's several reasons for doing that. One of them is that our world as a whole is changing. So if I just look back over some of the changes which have affected um, university education in the past decade, uh, if we look back 10 years uh, to 2012, we see what was called the year of the MOOC, the massive open online course. And in the last decade, MOOCs have sprung up all over the world. There have been thousands of them on different platforms at different institutions, and they have uh, to some extent changed the face of education. Now, alongside that, we get different technologies which our students can use. Uh, for example, we had Alexa came in in 2014. In 2019, uh, we had the Oculus Quest, uh, which was for virtual reality. In fact, the, the original Oculus Quest has already been supplanted three years on. So it's a really fast moving uh, technology sector. Of course, we've had COVID, which has made a vast impact on education around the world. And we've also had things like TikTok, which um, is, is becoming a preferred medium for a lot of our students. And one that I picked up on as this, this has been all over social media today about uh, chat.openai.com and the possibilities of AI, particularly in the education sector. And I'll come back to that later. Another thing is that the future we're preparing our students for is changing. Obviously, uh, only one aspect of that future is jobs. Uh, but if we look ahead, uh, some of the jobs which we are used to training people for are perhaps going to fade away in the next decade. Um, here are some predictions which came in from Canada about what jobs might be looking at in uh, like in 2030. And you'll see some of them are reworkings of what we've got now and some are jobs which these days we think of as, as very strange, but perhaps we can see the possibilities for those. Another thing, and I'm not expecting you to read all the text on this slide, is that our challenges are changing. Um, so what we've got here is uh, use of uh, an AI text generator by Professor Mike Sharples. Um, he went to the text generator and he gave it the prompt write an academic paper with the title Citizen Inquiry, Synthesizing Citizen Science and Inquiry Learning. He gave it no other prompts and it generated something um, which is very convincing, which would look convincing as a student essay, uh, which might even get quite a good mark as a student essay. And possibly the most obvious uh, way in which we can distinguish it from a student essay is that it's very well spelt and it's very grammatical, um, perhaps more so than, than most of us are when we're writing. And Mike, when he, when he generated this, he's done a lot of work in this area, he began thinking about, well, in the future, students will employ AI to write assignments and teachers might use AI to assess them. So this is the time that we need to be rethinking assessment. And uh, with, with the AIs which um, are going around on social media today, we see they've they've even taken a sort of bound forward uh, from what we're seeing here and really producing long pieces of very coherent work, uh, which educators on social media are saying, well, you know, I'd give this a B, I'd give this an A minus. I think this is this looks like good work, but it's it's something which has been generated in seconds by an AI. Um, another reason for looking to the future is um, it helps us to look at the past and to relate it to the past. So over on the right there is um, an excited media report from earlier this year. Oh, there's a whole new world. Education is meeting the metaverse. And I'm sure you've seen the headlines about the metaverse as this wonderful, new, exciting thing which could come into education. But actually, if we look back, um, so look back about a decade, there's a virtual field trip which we've been running at our university since 2013. And a lot of our undergraduates um, have been on that field trip studying geology, studying ecology. 
And then if we look back a bit further, um, in at the end of the 2000s, John Kirimure did a series of annual reports on the use of virtual reality in the UK. And at that point, every UK university except one had uh, something going on in a virtual world. But even if we go back 10 years before that, um, there's a report there from uh, Professor Denise Whitelock back in 1999, where she was developing an even earlier virtual field trip. So we've got all this experience of this sort of technology. We've got all this experience of using it in education. And so we need to be looking forwards and backwards at the same time to see what it is we already know. And I'd say a final reason uh, for looking forward is to take a critical perspective on some of the things which are going on in the educational world at the moment. And what I've got here is uh, three sets of tweets I've picked up um, over the last year, what a couple of them yesterday, I think. Um, so up at the top right there, um, we've got an educator saying, why is it that students said they really wanted to come back to the face-to-face -face classroom, but when I turn up to the face-to-face -face classroom, the students aren't there. On the left, uh, we've got an example of um, an early career academic, but she could easily be a student who's working from home and she's juggling all the things which go on at home. She's juggling family. Um, she's juggling the fact that she hasn't really got the right size workstation set up for her. And we have to bear in mind that our students are often working in this sort of situation. And then on the right at the bottom, um, uh, online proctoring, which has obviously been a huge issue uh, during remote working um, because institutions have been thinking about how can we do exams online? How can we be sure students aren't cheating? How can we should be sure that the student taking the exam is the student registered? And um, we, we've had really draconian uh, technology come in, uh, which has been extremely bad for the mental health of students. And there have been a lot of issues with this around the world. So we've got all these issues that we have to deal with. And uh, one of the ways that we do about that is, is think about future pedagogies. So I just encourage you all to think at the moment this moment. So there's been several things I've raised there. Think which of these challenges might prompt you to make changes to how teaching takes place at your institution. And that might be a change in, in your teaching or how you support teaching or how you manage teaching. Um, but I, th I think it's, it's worth thinking about the future with an eye to how it affects you and how you might make changes. So in terms of introducing innovations, we've done work in our department on why it is that quite a lot of educational innovations, especially those that use technology, uh, tend to be launched with great excitement and then uh, they often fail. And we've looked at what it is that makes a success of an innovation. And we found there are some building blocks which all need to be in place. You can't ignore any of these building blocks when you're trying to get an innovation in place. And the first one is, is probably don't start with a technology, don't start with a pedagogy, start with a vision. Start with what it is that you want to achieve with your learners. So I'm describing a vision as a description of an achievable and desirable end state. I put some examples there on the right. Um, you might want learners to be able to study where and when it suits them best. Or you want, might want your students to enjoy demonstrating what they've learned. Or you might want your learners to be inspired by world-renowned experts. So once you've got a vision, once you know what it is you're trying to achieve, then you can think about the pedagogy and the technology together. Do you need technology? Do you need to change your pedagogy? How are you going to go about that? When you've made those decisions, you can take those decisions to all the other people involved. And some of those people are the educators, the people who work with the educators. Some of those people are the learners. Does it make sense to the learners? Is that really helping them to achieve what you'd like? And some of those people are the enablers, um, the people who are managing things, the technicians who are supporting that. 
um, perhaps uh, the families of your learners, the people who are uh, in control of the budgets, all those people, they all need to be on board. You need to have an environment which is set up for whatever it is you're trying to do, especially if you're trying to use technology. Um, for example, if you're using something which has, um, which everybody needs technology, you need to think, is the internet in this room sufficient to support that? Have I got technicians who are willing to support that? Who is going to plug all those devices in and make sure they're charged? Who is going to make sure that uh, when the devices need updating, they're all updated? Who is going to make sure that they're mended? So it's not just thinking about the innovation when you bring it in. It's about thinking how that innovation is going to play out over the next year, over the next two years, over the five, next five years. And as you do these things, it's really important to reflect on what has happened, to evaluate what has happened. So you can go back and you can adjust these factors, keep adjusting these factors until you've moved towards your vision. Another thing uh, to consider is how you can match up um, pedagogies and technologies and uh, make use of, of different ones. Uh, what we found when people had to move to remote teaching very quickly um, was in a lot of cases, they suddenly forgot all about the activities for learning they knew about and uh, sort of went down to the basics of we know how to do a lecture we can do a video lecture and video lectures are really useful there's a great role for them but they're not the only activities for learning and they're not the only activities that you can do with technology so i put up some of the activities um, you might often use with your students obviously you're going to be assessing them at different points uh, and that's not just summarising where they are, but it's giving them um, constructive feedback, helping them to receive that. Um, you might encourage them to browse for information, uh, to construct things, to talk about things, to inquire about things, uh, to present to an audience um, and to reflect. And, and all these are activities uh, that you're going to keep wanting to do, whether you're online or offline. So I've just taken the same activities and I've thought about how you might do those online and uh, you might find that that opens up new possibilities or new ways of thinking about the same activities. So assessing, um, you, you've got the opportunities for online and peer review, for example, um, performing. It's not just doing it in front of the class now. Perhaps you might write a blog post or produce a TikTok story. There's a lot of opening out and new possibilities there. So back oh, about uh, 20, 25 years ago, when people began using the Internet in teaching and began using much more technology, uh, researchers began to think about, well, what is it that these technologies really add um, to our teaching and learning? And they identified six affordances of technology for learning, um, which were connectivity, extension, inquiry, personalization, publication, and scale. And I think over the last um, quarter century, um, we've seen that they got that pretty much right. Those, those are really good affordances which we can make use of. But something that we've seen during the pandemic is that all these things need to be underpinned by well-being. That needs to be an aspect of our teaching if our students are really going to benefit. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about those six affordances. And for each one, I'm going to give an example um, that we've included in a recent Innovating Pedagogy report. Um, so you can see how these things play out as we begin to uh, develop our pedagogies. And then I'll finish up um, by talking a little bit about well-being. So the first affordance I talked about was connectivity. Um, there's new ways of working with others around the world. Um, you've got tools uh, which you can use for networking, for collaboration and for conversational approaches to learning. So it's 
really move people away from just being able to talk to the people in the room uh, to being able to talk to a worldwide audience if they want to. Now, um, something which has been really pertinent, I expect, to all of us over the last year has been the hybrid models. As we've come out of uh, lockdown in different countries at different rates, uh, we've been thinking about how can we combine teaching in the classroom uh, with uh, teaching people who aren't in the classroom, but doing that at the same time. So some of our students might be at home uh, because they've not come back or because they're ill or because they've got long COVID, for various reasons. But some of our students are in the classroom. So it's no longer a question of face to face teaching or online teaching. In a lot of cases, we're uh, struggling to work out how to do hybrid teaching. And there have been lots of models developed for doing this. So I've, I've given a link there to um, a book about high flex, which is available online. Um, and some of the advantages of hybrid that you it gives the learner freedom to choose between topics and to select the pace at which they work. They don't have to necessarily work along with everybody else in the same room and have to finish uh, when that room booking ends. As an educator, you need to make sure that the different types of participation are going to lead to similar outcomes, that you're not privileging one group over another. Um, and you need to think about how your teaching materials can be reused in those different contexts uh, so that you're not having to produce two sets of completely different material, doubling your, your work. But you're beginning to think about and talk, talking to colleagues about how this can be done, um, which enables your learners uh, to perform adequately however they choose to learn, wherever they choose to learn. Uh, so some of the things which have been found to work in hybrid models are the active learning strategies. Um, so not just getting students to listen to the educator, uh, but when they've been given information, when they've been given ideas, uh, giving them tasks which help them to increase their understanding and to integrate that knowledge with what they already know. Uh, there are possibilities for collaborate, collaborative learning uh, between the classroom and the home. Uh, for example, you might do online voting um, to share opinions, or you might work with shared documents like Google Docs. So it doesn't matter where the students are. If your students are moving between different uh, locations, it's helpful to encourage them to think about the tools they're going to use for note taking logging events and reflection. So if they were used to always bringing a notebook to the classroom, um, you might be encouraging them to think about um, another approach. On the other hand, if they were used to always working with an online tool and they're suddenly working somewhere that's not online, they need to think again about how they're going to access those things. And formative feedback at all stages is really useful, um, sometimes from you as the educator, but also uh, people reflecting on their own work, evaluating their own work and um, giving comments uh, to their peers. And what's important, as that uh, quote on the, the right um, indicates, is what you need to avoid is students repeating undesirable face to face um, habits they might have picked up. Um, so we don't want students simply choosing not to attend certain lectures. We need to think about hmm, why is it they aren't attending? Uh, what can we do to engage them? Um, and what can we do to give them interesting things to do, which they really see the value in? In terms of extension, um, technology does support extended learning, which connects learning experience across locations and times and social settings. And to some extent, that's, that is like hybrid as well. Um, but it also takes us in different directions. And one of the ones that I picked up on is enriched realities. So enriched realities is one of the ways that people are now talking about augmented reality and virtual reality and how you bring those together. So if you're not quite sure about the distinction between all those, those different forms of reality, 
So we've got the day to day reality, which is our normal experience. Um, we've got the augmented reality um, where we use a device such as a smartphone to overlay information on our day to day experience. Um, so, for example, if any of you have played or have kids who have played something like Pokemon Go, uh, you'd be used to that concept of looking through your your phone and seeing the little Pokemon in, in the in the place that you are. And then virtual reality, um, get a 3D environment to interact with, uh, but usually that requires a headset. Um, so that's that's a little bit more constraining, uh, perhaps a little bit more clunky. And enriched realities is when you bring all those together um, to to achieve an effect. So this can really be useful um, if you want to create an experience that wouldn't be possible uh, in some other way. So the sort of thing that you might use in rich reality for, um, you might use it for remote exploration. Uh, there's lots of places um, in education that you might want to go to, but they're difficult, or they're too dangerous, or they're impossible to visit. I mean, the more extreme examples are, for example, when you want to visit the surface of the moon, or surface of Mars, have a look around there. Obviously, that would be impossible, uh, but you can do it with enriched reality. We might use it as a time machine uh, to go back into the past to explore historical events or um, to look at geological time periods, for example, or to look at evolution over a long period of time. Or you might use a more mundane um, setting and you might modify a scenario in order to draw attention to important aspects of it. Uh, so one of the things that um, happens in medical education is you might um, have an image of a body that you can sort of deconstruct, you can look under the skin, you can look at the muscles, you can look at the organs. And because there's a lot going on there, you might want to choose to highlight certain bits of that or to blow bits up so they're larger to look at. In terms of virtual rehearsal, um, it's a very good way of practicing something uh, that you really need to get first right first time uh, when you do it in real life. Um, so for example, they're used for midwifery. Um, they're used uh, in cases of triage, in cases of disaster management, um, in cases of um, dealing with terrorist attacks, uh, because you've got the opportunity to work through the system situation again and again and see what works and what doesn't work. The final one is, is just in time support, pulling up information that is relevant to what you're doing at the moment. Uh, for example, if you're doing something like changing a tire, being able to pull up in augmented reality the instructions on exactly what to do with the diagrams, have those in front of you, it can be a really useful thing. And I've watched, uh, I think I watched somebody recently change the tire on a, on a Mars lander. Uh, something I'd never done before, but they'd got augmented reality instructions that just talk them through it. The third affordance is inquiry, uh, because if you've got a smartphone and um, increasingly uh, in uh, the Western world um, and uh, the richer countries, uh, students do have access to a smartphone and it's full of sensors. Um, it's probably full of more sensors than most people realize, which allow you to analyze and record your environment and gives you the tools to organize and analyze that data. Um, that article that I've, I've put a link to on the right is, is the really fun one about uh, different ways of measuring a building with a smartphone. Some of them are very silly ways of doing it, but some of them are very precise ways of doing it. So in terms of inquiry, um, one of the, the approaches here is with online laboratories. I know when uh, pandemic lockdown uh, first struck, there were a lot of science teachers around the world going, well, how on earth do we carry on teaching um, when we can't get our students into the laboratories? But there have been huge strides in online labs and they give you lots and lots of options now. Um, so you can do the interactive screen experiments, um, you can simulate experiments, 
Uh, you can do really detailed examinations of uh, real data, such as microscope slides. So, for example, a virtual microscope uh, would allow you to use different magnifications and it would also allow you to polarise light in different ways. And also it allows um, an educator to get all their students looking at exactly the same part of the slide at the same time. Uh, rather than sort of hoping for the best about what they're looking at. You can get remote access to analytical instruments, and those might be small ones, or they might be something like a, a huge um, um, telescope in, a, in another country. You do remote control of robots. Um, as I've said, you can do virtual reality field trips. And also you can do a live uh, webcast um, so that you're in the lab doing something and your students can be watching and asking questions. So one of the big online labs uh, I put a link to there, uh, that's the one which works out of the Open University. Um, lots of things you can access there. Or another one that I've put here is, is a European Union one. So some of the advantages of online labs, um, when people first move to them, they, they tend to think, oh, well, this is this is a sort of depleted experience. And you don't get all the things that you get in a in a real life lab. And of course, you don't get all the things, but you get different things. Um, you get uh, opportunities to understand concepts and to carry out investigations. Uh, you get the opportunity for students to design meaningful experiments and to make sense of this to decide what to do next and they can carry on those experiments uh, between lessons they're not confined by the fact that you have to move out of the lab because somebody else is coming in um, they're really good at providing feedback that guides learning uh, as with um, sort of extended reality um, one of the virtues of being online is that you can get access to things like dangerous or rare materials and you can understand what happens in reactions with them or you can look at them, examine them. Uh, for example, moon rocks. Uh, you probably wouldn't be able to get hold of a real moon rock. They're very expensive. Um, but online, you can get hold of microscopes, slides of them. You can examine them. You can do all the things that you would want to do. And overall, it just helps students to prepare for careers as scientists because more and more of work as scientists is happening online and remotely. For example, when I talk to um, planetary science students, they say, well, an enormous amount of our work is, is things like um, controlling uh, experiments on Mars. We're never going to go to Mars. We're doing this remotely or we're using a telescope, which is hundreds of miles away. Um, but it can be uh, controlled remotely. And what's important is we know how to uh, use it. And we know how to analyze that data. Fourth affordance is around personalization. And this is something that I know there's been a huge amount of interest in over decades. People are really interested in how you can use technology to personalize education to individual students or groups of students. And one of the reasons uh, that that seems possible is that whenever students interact with technology, they're generating data sets and those data sets can be used potentially to help learners and they can be used to create personalized pathways. The example I've got there is, is a demo app which was uh, created at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, what I think is interesting about that is when people started using learning analytics, uh, they tended to start with the data and crunching the data to see what they could do with the data and would then present that to educators or to students. But this is taking a slightly different uh, view. It's saying, OK, we've got all that data, but what is the data that you as the student are interested in? Uh, which period are you interested in? Um, do you want to know about your attendance? Do you want to know about your performance? Do you want to know about your social interaction? And so beginning to put that in the student's hand um, to really personalise things from their perspective uh, rather than from what we assume uh, they would like. Which really takes us into the field of student-led learning analytics. Um, so if you've, if you've not encountered learning analytics before, I expect most of you have. 
Um, but the, the definition uh, used by the Society for Learning Analytics Research is that learning analytics is about measuring, collecting, analyzing, reporting data about learners. And not just doing that, but doing that in order to understand and optimize or improve the learning and the environments in which it occurs. So the sort of data crunching, the data collecting is the first part of that, but thinking about why you're doing that and how you're supporting students with it is the second part. And more and more, uh, we're seeing the importance of this being a student-led process. So if we think about student-led learning analytics, um, a big part of that is thinking about what students' actual goals are. Now, we as educators have goals for our students, and those goals for our students are usually things like, we'd like you to um, learn these things, we'd like you to develop this knowledge, we'd like you to have these skills, and we'd like you to complete the course and pass the exams. But students may be coming at it from a different perspective. So in some cases, they might not be very interested in the subject matter. They may just have to finish to complete this course to finish their qualification. On the other hand, they might be deeply, deeply interested in some part of the material and really want to focus on that. Or they might be very interested in the material, but they've got something going on in their lives, which means that at this point uh, they need um, to focus on the important bits that get getting through the exam. Um, so they, they've got all sorts of different goals, which aren't necessarily quite the ones we expect. So if we get students to think about their own goals, to set those, then they can receive a tailored learning analytics advice, which is really going to be helpful for them and work for them. Another thing we can do is we can get students to rate those analytics and to share how appropriate they are. Um, we get people to do this uh, with other apps. Um, so we need to sort of relinquish some of the control, I think, with learning analytics and trust our students to make good use of them. And perhaps also um, to use them to rate other things like their learning materials. Is this, easy? Is this learning material too hard? Is it too easy? Is it fun to engage with it? Is it engaging? Um, and adding those sorts of ratings helps them as students to think about what they're studying, helps their colleagues to think about it, and helps us as educators to understand what it is they want. Um, so the quote here from, from Innovating Pedagogy says that if we focus just on grades and predicting student outcomes based on previous behavior, we might wrongly identify which learners are at risk because there's all sorts of contextual things going on with learners that the learners themselves are very aware of. And if we put those together with learning analytics, we get something much more powerful. The fifth of the six affordances is publication. Um, that uh, technology means our students can engage in authentic tasks. Uh, they can connect their learning with experiences outside the classroom. And they can share opportunity. They can share things uh, worldwide if they want to, and that's very different to how things used to be, where if they were asked to write something, really they were only writing it for the teacher or perhaps for one or two other people in the classroom, uh, but it never got any further. Whereas now we can put things out to authentic audiences. So the examples I've pulled in in the pictures there. Um, student up at the top right, uh, she's a medical student, she can't see, she can't hear, uh, and she's sharing her experiences um, via um, TikTok and via Twitter. Uh, at the bottom there, we've got a blog um, from an Open University student. So we do encourage our students to keep a reflective journal, perhaps to keep a blog, uh, but how they do that, how they go about that, what they share, how openly they share it is up to them. And on the left there, we've got TikTok uh, from a young learner uh, talking about how to get exam tips and hints from her university professor. Um, I think generally the, the answer to that question is ask your university professor and they're usually quite willing to give you um, some exam tips. But um, 
she shared that on TikTok. There's a whole subset on TikTok of this sort of advice going on. So if we take that away from what students are doing individually and we think about it in terms of pedagogy, uh, one of the pedagogies we've had come up recently is virtual studios. And if you work in a creative discipline, uh, you're probably really used to working in a studio uh, with your learners and with other professionals. And you're used to it as a sort of busy place where people are constructing things, they're creating things, they're challenging each other. Uh, everybody's observing what other people are doing, commenting on it, and critiquing it. And that's a sort of really beautiful dynamic process. And again, it's one of the ones that people thought, oh, we've moved online, we've lost all that. But virtual studios give you the option of being able to um, replicate some of that online and also to extend it in some ways. Um, so on the right there, we've, we've got an example from the virtual studio at the Open University, just some of the responses to a single design task. I think there's about 100 up there. Um, there were a couple of hundred responses to it overall, a lot of students coming in um, and engaging with each other, looking at each other's work. So a virtual studio gives you uh, opportunities for sharing experiences, sharing ideas, uh, getting lots of rapid feedback. You've got the tools alongside it for recording and reflecting and talking about these things. Um, because you've got scale, uh, you can fit a lot more people in a virtual studio than you can in a physical studio. You've got a bit more exposure to other people's ideas. Uh, you can bring in the local community. You can bring up in support networks. And also because you've got a lot of people there, it becomes much more attractive to makers and partners who might perhaps not want to come in for a small group of students. But if you say, well, we've got 100 students here who are really interested in knowing what's going on at your company and engaging with your ideas, um, scale can really uh, bring people in like that. Which takes me on really to affordance six, which is uh, the affordance around scale. We really began to notice uh, the advantages of learning at scale when we came to massive open online courses. And of course, now on those MOOC platforms, uh, a lot of um, them are producing micro-credentials, which means that micro-credentials are often offered at scale as well. Um, so they give opportunities for networking and for learning through conversations and actually for sharing ideas around the world. So the example I've got there is uh, from a course that um, I was working on a couple of years ago. And as an icebreaker, the students on the course I think we had 100 at that point, um, were asked to browse the internet, find images that for them represented learning, and then bring those images back, share them with other people, and share why they thought this was the best image of learning. And what we got from those 100 students was 98 different images, 98 different interpretations of learning. And all really interesting, really good conversation starters and much more than than we as educators um, would have brought in. You know, we'd have selected these are our favourite you know, two or three, perhaps. Uh, but we certainly wouldn't have brought in 98 and brought in all those different perspectives. And so that's something, again, you can do with scale. So moving that into micro credentials, because lots of people are talking about micro credentials around the world at the moment. Um, and there's lots of definitions of micro credentials. So I'm going to talk about them here as accredited short courses, which are used to develop workplace skills. Um, if you're uh, moving into micro credentials at your institution, and I know a lot of people are, it's worth thinking about what is different about a micro-credential, um, partly in terms of scale and partly in terms of being online, which makes it different from doing the same sort of um, thing in the classroom. So obviously one of the important things which is different is the emphasis on career, workplace and professional skills. I know quite a lot of university lecturers find that 
uh, shift in balance quite difficult uh, because we're used to um, conveying certain sorts of knowledge, certain sorts of skills, and perhaps then relating them to career. Uh, but this puts career uh, front and centre. It's worth uh, bearing in mind that learners on these courses may have substantial uh, relevant experience. Um, so they're not necessarily people who come just from school, have no work experience. Uh, they may be trying to uh, move upwards in their career, um, but building on a lot of um, things they've already done. So they've got a lot that they can share with their fellow learners. But at the same time, because they're not those people who've just come out of school, they've got a lot of commitments that take precedence. In most cases, they've got a full time job. Uh, they're obviously likely to have family or caring responsibilities. So the um, whole course needs to be planned with flexibility to take that into account. When you're doing a micro credential online, um, sometimes it's, it's tempting just to give students the information. But if they've got opportunities to interact, we know that not only does that help them to build uh, knowledge together, it also helps to keep them on the course because they they feel they're finding people, they're finding community. And actually, in terms of uh, workplace skills, uh, they're probably going to be networking as well. They may be uh, based in different countries, so they're going to have different expectations about uh, teaching and learning. Um, you need to take into account that they're not necessarily going to be used to your education system. And so uh, you might want to talk to them about what they were expecting, do some evaluation over time. And also they need the skills to take responsibility for their learning process because they're working at a distance, because typically micro credentials don't have quite the same level of support as being on a university campus. They need a, lot, a whole set of skills, which needs, means you need to build into your courses um, opportunities for them to develop those skills. Uh, they need to be able to identify their goals. They need to be able to block out time. They need to uh, get out a diary or a calendar and put in the course dates. They need to think about their workspace and when that workspace is going to be available to them. And if they're going to have the Internet available, when are the children going to be around and uh, needing attention? All those sorts of things. Have they got to change their note taking tool uh, to something they can move between locations? Can they find support with their study? And often they can in the workplace, uh, but sometimes they just need a push to do that. So those are the six affordances which are really useful, I, I think, to, to consider when you're considering any uh, new pedagogy or introducing a new technology to your classroom. But what we've seen over um, lockdown is that it's really important that they're underpinned by us thinking about student well-being and not only student well-being, but thinking about the well-being of, of educators and all those who are supporting learning. So there's a quote over here on the right from UNESCO, which I think is quite powerful, saying that no education system is effective unless it promotes the health and well-being of its students its staff and its community. And it's something that perhaps in the past we'd hive off to a student welfare team um, or to, you know, there'd be people who had responsibility for that on campus. Uh, but when we're working with more distributed student populations, we really need to be all taking a bit of responsibility for that. Um, so well-being, one of the things is about helping students to learn about how, where and when they should be seeking help. Uh, we need to be um, including mechanisms that support learners, uh, building a student centred environment, finding out what students from students, what is getting in the way of their well-being and addressing that and taking that seriously uh, rather than seeing it as a problem that the students are going to have to deal with themselves. So building in compassion and empathy and also showing that we're supporting teachers as well as learners so that we see everybody's well-being as important. 
I'm not expecting you to to be able to read this diagram. Um, I've put in a link there and there's a more detailed link if you download the slides. Uh, but this is some work who, done by Kate Lister and her colleagues while working at the Open University, looking at the enablers and the barriers to well-being. And they found three major block uh, sets there, one study related, one skills related, one environmental. Um, and they broke those down into the sort of major areas for all these, for thinking about curriculum and tuition and assessment, the skills, people. And then they broke them down even further. That's the outer ring of this circle. And I, th I think what the diagram as a whole shows is that there are lots and lots of places where you can be thinking about well-being, uh, bringing it into your classroom, bringing it into your pedagogy. Um, and some of that is uh, for the educators to do, some of that is for managers or support staff, and some of it is, is helping students to take that responsibility for themselves. But they also, this all builds into a pedagogy of care. Um, thinking about our students, caring for them, their well-being and their happiness, thinking about their whole selves. And so this is something that we can design into our courses right from the start, being clear about how students can reach out for help, embedding flexibility so that students see different ways of getting to their deadlines, recognising the barriers they might face, helping them to overcome those barriers, giving different ways of engaging uh, with the material, with the activities, helping them to see that um, their pedagogy is sustaining their culture, you know, what, what they value, helping students to know and support each other. These are all things that we can begin to think of right at the beginning when we're talking about any of our pedagogies and build these in and really help our students to enjoy their learning and to see it as a valuable part of their life um, and to see that their, their lecturers care for them. So I'm finishing up with a reflection opportunity again, um, thinking about what you might take away from, from these ideas. Um, there's lots of pedagogies that I've gone through here. There's even more in the reports, cover 10 each year. Uh, but what my, one change might you make um, in response to these opportunities? And then I'll leave you um, with just uh, some links there as a link to SlideShare, where these slides are up with their links in them. Um, you can see me on my blog or Twitter or Mastodon. And I really do encourage you to go and have a look at uh, one or more of the innovating pedagogy reports. Uh, they're all up openly on uh, the blog. And I think they're all a very interesting read. So thank you very much. And um, I'm happy to yeah. answer questions. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rebecca, for that <clears throat> excellent. OK, so I was just waiting for the applause to end at this end. And uh, thank you, Rebecca, for the excellent synthesis and categorization of the affordances of technologies and how we may use them. We have about five minutes, so I think I can take uh, one or two questions from the room and one or two questions online. I'm also logged in online, so online participants can simply put their questions on the chat. Anyone from the room? Yeah. Hello, Rebecca. Good evening. Hello. This is Wei Qin. Um, Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Really appreciate that you uh, have systematically gone through this and shared with us many of the methods that we can take home and practice in our real te in our teaching. And one of my one my question cons is concerned about the hybrid model that you uh, you showed mm -hmm. in, in your slides and from my experience that when we teach in hybrid 
model, then they still we tend to end up in a virtual uh, model because the students do not have incentives to come to classroom anymore. And we share, we do online voting, we do Google Docs, and then these activities does not give the students uh, yeah, incentives to come to classroom. So do you have any suggestions that you can share with us and to bring students back to classroom? Uh, and uh, how do we, yeah, how do we uh, combine the, the two groups? of students yeah uh, so this is this is quite an interesting one for us because I work at a distance university uh, we spend very little time with our students face to face um, so we don't spend a lot of time in a hybrid um, environment and that means we think very carefully about what it is that we want to bring students into a face-to-face -face environment for now, I think if you're used to working in a face to face environment and it's all suddenly been flipped over the last years, uh, you're coming at it from a different perspective of, well, you know, face to face is obviously best. Why don't the students want to come back to this? I think it's useful to sit down with your colleagues and to discuss why it is uh, that you want your students to be in the classroom what you think they're getting from being in this classroom that they wouldn't be getting at home or wherever else it is they're working. And then talking about how you can really bring out those features and how you can bring those features um, home to students. So for example, I was talking to a student the other day um, who would normally be studying or a couple of hundred miles away from where I live, but is, is currently around the corner. And he said, well, my tutor said I have to come in for some sessions. Um, so he wants me to come in once a month and he wants me to come in um, to uh, discuss things in a group with other students. He said, but when I've travelled all that way and it takes a day there and a day back, he said, we just sit there and nobody says anything in the group and it's a complete waste of time. And I thought, yeah, this, the, the, the educators sort of got halfway there. The educators thought, yes, it is valuable for our students to be together and in a group and discussing things and comparing perspectives, but hasn't actually gone the extra step of saying, of showing students how to do that, of, of really talking them through it. And I think in the past, um, nobody's queried that because everybody's been in the classroom and they're told to go into groups. So they go into groups and they don't say anything and they come out of the groups again. Uh, but now that they've seen there's an option that they could they could be at home doing something else, uh, they're not doing it. So I think it's really important to think about why am I having the students in the classroom? Um, have I conveyed to them why it's important? rather than just saying it's conventional and giving them the skills to really benefit from that. Um, so those are my tips there. Uh, I'm sure other people have got other tips. Um, and I think one of the important things here is we're slightly in, in uncharted territory. Um, and, and that's why when I was talking about uh, hybrid, I, I did a connection out to a high flex book uh, where people have thought about this in detail and shared tips around it. Thank you, Rebecca, for that. Uh, <coughs> um, in, uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. And I'm still looking to see if there is a question on the chat. Um, I can't okay. see anything there. No. Um, yeah, I see John with a hand raised. John, we are one minute past the time. So can you please Ooh. keep it? quick and brief one one minute it's hard um Rebe rebecca really enjoyed your presentation I'd, I'd just uh like you to comment a little bit about um the implications for assessment particularly in social sciences given these recent developments in ai text generators 
Yes, I think it is going to prompt a lot of change. I think one of the things which uh, people have been talking about is that in the past, um, assessment was was sort of disposable, that you, you wrote something and it was only for the exam, it was only for your lecturer, and then at the end of that, you know, you got a mark for it and you essentially threw it away. If uh, people are being given things which are more real life, which they can take, uh, they can share with other people, um, that can be useful to other people in the future, um, thinking about that sort of task um, and uh, assessing them on not only how they do that, but on how how much it's shared, how much it's used. That is uh, one aspect. Uh, another way of going about it is rather than setting questions for your students, getting your students to set the questions and then marking their questions. Um, because to ask a good question, you need to know the subject. And uh, you can actually come up with rubrics for marking questions that your students have come up with. And, you know, how, uh, can this be answered? Will it will it elicit the information you need? Um, so flipping it on the head like that is one way of getting at it. Love that answer. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. So uh, thank you very much. And I'm afraid that's all the time that we have. So once again, thank you, Rebecca, for a very insightful talk and also insightful answers to the questions. I hope, uh, you know, we will be able to keep in touch with you and maybe see you in person at a future ICCE. That would be so thank lovely. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.